In this video, we'll cover everything you need to know about Class D airspace. We'll also give you real-world ATC examples to help you arrive and depart the Delta with confidence. Cessna 647 Delta Sierra cleared to land, runway 27 left. Hi, I'm Greg from Pilot Institute, the online ground school that makes aviation easy. So first, what is this airspace? Well, Class D surrounds airports that are busy enough that they need a control tower, but aren't as crowded as Class C airports. You'll typically find it at regional airports near cities or larger towns. But don't be fooled, Delta airports are anything but quiet. They are often home to lively flight training schools and jet operations. If you could see the airspace in three dimension, it would look very much like a cylinder. It starts at the surface and typically extends to 2,500 feet above the airport. It also has a radius of about four nautical miles, although the exact size depends on the airport. Okay, let's see what Class D airport looks like on a chart. Here's New Bedford Regional Airport in Massachusetts. You can see the boundary as a dash blue circle. Inside the circle is also a box with a number on the inside. This tells us the top or the ceiling of the airspace in hundreds of feet MSL. MSL here stands for mean sea level, meaning that our altitude above sea level. Now this is different from AGL, above ground level. Now the 2.6 here means that the ceiling is 2,600 feet MSL. But now let's take a look at Westchester County Airport. The ceiling here starts with a minus sign. No, the airport is not underground, although that would actually be pretty cool. The sign here means that the ceiling goes up to, but not including, 3,000 feet MSL. This is because there's an overlying Bravo airspace that starts at 3,000 feet MSL. The chart can tell us a lot about the airport as well. For example, CT means control tower, and then the frequency is 118.575. The star indicates that the control tower operates part-time. Now you might be wondering why a tower sometimes shuts down. Well, the airport that aren't very busy outside peak hours typically shut the tower down overnight. For example, New Bedford Regional is open from 6.30 a.m. to 10 p.m. And some airports are only busy during certain times of the year. Take East Hampton Town Airport, for example. It only has an operating control tower during the busy summer month to deal with the huge traffic of vacationers. The rest of the year, it's uncontrolled. But what happens when the tower closes? Well, notice that the chart supplement says other times class G. This means that when the tower is closed, the delta disappears, and then the airport's airspace becomes uncontrolled Gulf airspace. But not all part-time delta revert to class Gulf. Sometimes it changes to class Echo. So how does the FAA determine which one? If aircraft can remain in contact with ATC down to the runway, and the airport has weather reporting that meets standards, the airspace can become class E. If it can't, then it becomes class G. This blue circle with a C in the middle means that when the tower is closed, this frequency becomes the Common Traffic Advisory Frequency, or CTAF. Pilots will use the CTAF to self-report their position. Now take a look at Concord Municipal Airport. Is this Class D? Nope. The magenta dash circle tells us that it's actually a Class E starting at the surface. But you'll sometimes see similar markings around Delta airspace. For example, at Martha's Vineyard Airport, the dash magenta shape indicates that the Class Echo is an extension that starts at the surface. This allows IFR aircraft to remain in controlled airspace during approach. Now, if you're flying VFR, you don't have to talk to ATC in that specific area. Now, what happens to extension when the tower closes? Well, since Martha's Vineyard reverts to Gulf airspace, the echo extension also disappears. At airports that revert to echo airspace, the extensions remain. Remember how we said that most Delta airspace look like a cylinder? Well, there are some exceptions that you should be aware of. If the airport's extension is less than two nautical miles, the FA extends the Delta instead of using echo airspace. Other deltas have cutouts, so pilots at nearby airports don't have to contact the tower every time they fly. Now here's an interesting one. Take a look at Quonset State Airport. Part of the delta is cut off by the Class C airspace. The delta goes up to 2,500 feet MSL, but some of it underlies the Class Charlie shelf, which starts at either 1,300 or 1,700 feet above sea level. Pilots need to be careful and stay out of the Charlie without permission. Okay. Now that you know what Class D is and what it looks like, let's talk about what you need to enter it. So you can divide the requirements into three categories, equipment, pilot, and VFR minimums. Let's start with equipment. Good news, there is only one simple requirement, a two-way radio. To enter the Delta, you first need to establish two-way radio communication with the control tower. We'll talk about how to do that in the next section. Now, unlike Class B or Class C, 
you don't need a mode C transponder or ADS-B out. But many Delta towers receive a radar feed from nearby approach control. So if you don't have a transponder, you won't show up on their screen and they'll probably ask why they can't see you. Okay, quiz time. What equipment do you need to land at Quonset State Airport? Two-way radio, two-way radio and GPS, two-way radio and mode C transponder. Two-way radio, a mode C transponder, and ADSB out. Well, if you chose D, you'd be correct. Even though the Delta only requires a radio, you'd be flying under the Charlie, which requires a mode C transponder and ADSB out. Okay, next up, pilot requirements. As long as you hold at least the student pilot certificate, you can enter Class D airspace. But if you're a student pilot or new to flying at towered airports, make sure that you're comfortable with basic radio procedures before flying solo into a busy Delta. Next is the VFR weather minimums. Many pilots use Cessna 3152 as a memory aid. The 3 means 3 miles of visibility, the 152 is for the cloud clearance. You must remain 1,000 feet above, 500 feet below, and 2,000 feet horizontally from the clouds. Now, these minimums ensure that you have a clear view of other aircraft as well as the ground. Now, if the cloud ceiling is less than 1,000 feet, the tower won't allow VFR operations. Getting out of the Delta airport in these conditions, you'll need to file IFR or request what's called a special VFR clearance. A special VFR clearance requires at least one mile of visibility and the ability to remain clear of clouds. Now, you must be at least a private pilot to request one. And if you request one at night, you need to also have an instrument rating and your airplane must be instrument equipped. But as handy as special VFR clearances can be, there are not really too many ways to use them safely and scud running along your route is not one of them. So read up on the topic before you launch VFR into bad weather. Now, let's talk about how you fly into Class Delta airspace. Let's say that you're planning a short trip in your Skyhawk from Finlay, Ohio to the Ohio State University Airport just outside of Columbus. During your pre-flight, you need to spend some time getting familiar with the airspace and the airport layout. On the sectional, you can see that OSU Airport sits beneath the Charlie Shelf of Columbus International, so you'll need to stay below 2,500 feet MSL if you get vectored south or east of the airport. The airport diagram also shows three runways in a somewhat unique layout. Three marked hotspots indicate confusing areas. Make sure that you brief them by reading their description in the chart supplement. Now flip to the airport entry and read any remarks and noise abatement procedures. The little diagram here is very handy. It shows the approach, the passy, and the papi light locations. The cone shapes tells you where the wind socks are located and the star is the rotating beacon. Now you'll have a pretty good idea of what to expect when you arrive. Now once you're airborne, tune into the airport ATIS about 20 miles out from your destination. Write down the important information like weather, altimeter setting, and active runways. Note the phonetic identifier, for example, information alpha. You'll need to report the identifier to the tower so they know that you have the latest information. Next, switch to the tower frequency when you're about 10 miles out. Before you can enter the Delta, you'll need to establish two-way radio communication with the tower, but don't immediately hit the push to talk button. Make sure to listen first. Is it slow or is it buzzing like a beehive? You need to adjust your radio technique depending on how busy the airspace is. Let's say that the frequency is very congested. You might want to actually cold call first. For example, State Tower, Skyhawk November 647, Delta Sierra. This lets them know that you have a request while actually respecting the controller's workload. If the tower can't deal with you just yet, they might respond with saying, Aircraft calling State Tower, standby. Does that mean that you can fly into the airspace? Nope. Even though you talk to them and they talk to you, they have to acknowledge your call sign in order to count as two-way radio communication. So you'll need to circle outside the Delta and wait for further instructions. Now, what if they say, Cessna 647 Delta Sierra remain outside the class Delta. Can you legally enter the Delta? Still no. Sure, you've established two-way radio communication, but the tower is asking you to stay out, so you need to comply. If the tower frequency is not very busy, you can transmit the entire request. Just keep it short and clear. Tell them who you are, what you are, where you are, and what you want to do, and the ATIS identifier. For example, State Tower, Skyhawk November 647 Delta Sierra, 10 miles northwest, inbound for landing with information alpha. The tower will respond with instructions like, Cessna 647 Delta Sierra, State Tower, roger. Report four mile right base, runway 27 left. As with all ATC instructions, read them back. 
Report 4 mile right base, runway 27 left, 647 Delta Sierra. So can you enter the Delta right now? Yes, you finally can. Now, if you're worried that your radio skills aren't good enough for the Delta, our radio communication made easy class is perfect for you. Click the link in the comments to learn more. Now, it might not affect you in your single engine Cessna, but there are speed limits inside the Delta. It's 200 knots once you're at or below 2,500 feet AGL and within four nautical miles of the airport. This is pretty much the exact dimensions of most Deltas. Okay, as you make your way into the airspace, make a mental picture of the traffic. Are there airplanes in the pattern? Where exactly is that business jet on the long straight and final? Yes, the tower is there to prevent collision and ensure that things run smoothly, but avoiding traffic is ultimately the pilot's responsibility. Now listen closely for your call sign. ATC may need to vector you for traffic or change runways. If you're unsure about what they're asking, request clarification. They're here to help. When you're four miles out, check in with the tower as requested. State tower, Cessna 647 Delta Sierra, four miles right base, runway 27 left. At this point, you will likely get your landing clearance. Cessna 647 Delta Sierra cleared to land, runway 27 left. Again, read back the clearance and complete your checks. After landing, make sure the aircraft completely crosses the whole short line. The tower will usually tell you to contact ground control for taxi instructions, for example, Cessna 647 Delta Sierra, turn left on Charlie, then right on Alpha to the ramp. Make sure to read back the instructions and keep your airport diagram handy. This is where your pre-flight studying really pays off, especially at airports with complex taxiways. Now, of course, if you get lost, don't hesitate to ask the ground controller for help. Once you cross from the movement area into the non-movement area, you no longer need to worry about ATC. But you're not done just yet, not until you shut down the engine. Keep your head outside as you taxi to parking. Now it's time to grab yourself a drink and a snack at the FBO to celebrate your accomplishment. Okay, now let's talk about how to depart Class D airspace. First, obtain the ATIS and note any special instructions. For example, at OSU Airport, the controller wants VFR aircraft to report their on-course heading in degrees. Some airports are fine by using cardinal directions. So when you're ready, contact ground control. State ground. Skyhawk November 647 Delta Sierra at the FBO, departing VFR heading 330, ready to taxi with information Bravo. Ground Control will come back with taxi instruction. Cessna 647 Delta Sierra, state ground. Taxi runway 27 left via Alpha. Write the clearance down and read it back. During your taxi, make sure that you don't cross any runways without permission and always have your trusty airport diagram at the ready. If you want VFR flight following, you can request it from ground control. They'll coordinate with approach and give you a squad code, departure frequency, and other instructions. And when you're ready to go, contact the tower. State tower, Cessna 647 Delta Sierra, holding short runway 27 left, ready for departure. The tower will then clear you for takeoff and give you departure instructions. For example, Cessna 647 Delta Sierra, clear for takeoff, runway 27 left, fly runway heading. After you've cleared any conflicting traffic, tower will clear you on course. As you climb out, keep an eye on other traffic in the area. If you requested VFR flight following, the tower will tell you when to contact departure. Otherwise, wait until you clear of the Delta before switching frequencies. Now, if you want to nail every transmission in the Delta, check out our radio communication made easy class right here. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.